I'm delighted to say we're joined by John Considine of the UCC Economics Department. Um, John, good morning to you. How are you doing? Good morning, John. Not too bad. Thank you. This is obviously a story that you've been covering for decades at this point, and um, maybe it's worth putting some context on the fact that this isn't really a new aspect of this story. It's just the latest flare-up of it. Um, your research goes all the way back to 1997 when the sports capital grants were initiated. Uh, initially, it was, it was lottery funding at that point, and then it became lottery and public exchequer funding. So maybe you might talk to us a little bit about how that funding has traditionally broken down. Yeah, um, the National Lottery, of course, was put in place for good causes, and sport was deemed to be one of the good co causes. And then uh, the, the Department of Sport started publishing the grants in 1998, which facilitated us doing the research. So effectively, what we went and looked at, it, as economists, where, let's say, we'd, get, we'd be the grey profession, dismal science, etc. So we just went and looked to see, and our argument would be, look, this would be done on an interest basis. So we said, we expected that the money would go geographically to ministers' constituencies, first of all. And then the second thing we expected, that it would go to whoever was funding that, which was coming through, was being channeled through the Department of Finance. And we found that when Jim McDade was in uh, the Department of Sport, uh, Donegal got the highest per capita. Uh, when he left, Donegal slid down the rankings and he's replaced by John O'Donoghue. Then they come up, uh, Donegal goes to the first place. Now you could argue at that stage, well look, um, maybe it's just been a fall, but of course then he gets replaced by uh, later on, for example, with a, a serious amount of years, let's put it this way, Michael Ring and let's say Mayo do quite well. So we found that there was a geographical uh, distribution that the money followed the minister basically. And, uh, you know, now we have, I know he's from the Fine Gael gene pool, but uh, we have a minister who is independent and the grants are still coming under criticism. But I think there's something different about the criticism this time. It's more based on, let's say, income rather than the geographic spread, although I know the, 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 the tweet and the school in question is, you know, closely, let's say, more closely linked to the minister, etc. Yeah, so effectively it's the point that Paul Rice was making there, that this, is a, this has become a class issue where uh, certain classes know how to access money and funding and other classes don't. Yes, well, I, I, class... Paul's a historian, um, and uh, I, I'm an economist. I, I wouldn't necessarily put it by class. I, I, I think there, I think, I think there, there is, but and I think some of the class issue is the fact that it's Shane Ross. I mean, look, Shane Ross is a, comes across as a very different minister than somebody like Michael Ring or some of the others. Um, you know, it may be a reaction to an identification of him with the the class area, but I'm not so sure if. Um, I, I, on this one, I, I, I think the bigger issue here is the number of appeals and how, how they got, got missed. Now, I think pa Paul made a very good point about um, the ability, and John Green made it last night as well, about the ability to fill out these forms. Gr John Green explained that, you know, he had to go through it a second time. And, you know, they're difficult to do. Now, these, are, these are grants were designed originally as matching grants, which means that the, you have to put, put up some of your own money. So, in other words, it doesn't... It helps those who already can do this. So, for example, the GA do quite well because they have a very good social network. People stay with the GA. It's the one club that you would have for life and you put something back in, etc. and there's expertise in that area. So, as a result, those who already have facilities, already have the social network, already have people in there, do better at these because they were originally designed in that fashion. They were designed to say, look, if you do something for yourself, so to speak, um, we will help you. Um, so they were designed in that way, and they've, they've done what it says on the tin. I mean, the bigger issue, I think, that, that Paul identified last night, not in the clip that you had there, but you know, he felt that the clubs were left down by uh, the overall governing of, governance of sport in Ireland, the, the politicians, and by the, maybe their own sporting organisations, and maybe even the local government in the area. Yeah, there, there's like, that's a, a holy trinity of mediocrity that you've described there, um, where none of the organising bodies themselves have got a, a person whose job it is to help these smaller clubs fill in the forms, because like that would be an, an immediate breakthrough if, um, if one of these governing bodies of the sports decided that they were going to target these grants, uh, learn how the forms were to be filled in, go on a roadshow around the country, and filling in the forums basically on behalf of the, the clubs, that would definitely help. But 
notwithstanding that, small local communities here are at a massive disadvantage if they don't have somebody who knows how to game the system or fill in the forms. Correct. And I think, you know, if you were to give one piece of advice from this, you would say to the local to whoever's applying for these things, go and sit, first of all, in your local TD's office and get them to fill out the, the form with you. Get, them, get, the, get the help from there. Um, get, you need help on these. These are fairly complicated issues, etc. You need to get help. And it means that, you know, and usually what happens is you have people in these areas who are struggling to keep the club itself on the road and don't have that expertise and maybe don't even have the people to help. And it's, it's a big issue in Irish sport. We, we, like we had a line item. We have a line item in the, the sports boat where it's you know, money going to disadvantaged areas. And we funded that out of money from dormant accounts. Like why not just reallocate money from other parts of the budget? I know I'll have, I'll, have, I'll have everybody giving out about this. How are you give? But reallocate money from there to the money for sport in disadvantaged areas, just full stop. There is a line item that was, has been there for a while. Why not just reallocate money to that area and say this is money specifically designated for sport in disadvantaged areas? Just explain that, will you? So, in other words, we, we had, if you look at the sports vote um, and you look at where the money goes, so what we did uh, over time is we said, okay, we need to have a, a special agency for... Uh, the running of the current side of sport for the, the running of the day-to-day side. So we took it out of the department, and Sport Ireland is, the, is, is what we have now as of that. So they get, they get funded through that line item. Then there's this, a line item which says we will fund sports grants to bodies, sports capital grants to bodies, and this is funded by the National Lottery Funding plus some exchequer funding. So there's a line item there for that. This is the item that we're talking about now. This is, these are the sports grants, etc. Why not just take some of that money and put it down below where it says grants to uh, disadvantaged areas? There's a line item that can be down there, and you can ring fence it for these areas. And I think that would be a better way of starting, because otherwise, the this process, which the refinement of this process, the refinement of this process of making sure people met X, Y, and Z, has come about because of improvements. These were actually improvements made because they said, oh. We need to make sure this happens. We need to make sure this happens. So in actually trying to improve it and trying to improve the process, giving people more hurdles to jump, it's a bit like health and safety regulation, and it gave them more hurdles to jump. And as a result, it gets more difficult for people who don't have that backup support of maybe an accountant in the organization, an engineer, a quantity surveyor. If you don't have that support, the forms which were designed to weed out let's say, bad applications, um, are now different. Um, so I think you should ring fence the money and say, look, this money is specifically going for sport in disadvantaged areas and make it, make it a sizable amount. Um, we, look, it, 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 I don't have the numbers here now directly in front of me, but it was a pittance. It was, it was like it was low single digits uh, of the percentage allocated. So we, we should do something like that because... You know, it, it's all very well to say, oh, it'll, it'll wash out in this process. It will not wash out in this process. This, these are matching grants. These are designed to give money, I would say, to people who already have it, because you have to have the matching element. Okay, the requirement is smaller for disadvantaged areas, but it still favors those who already have. Um, so if you, want, if you want to make a decision that we need to fund sport in disadvantaged areas, which I think we should, but that's... That that's a political decision, it's not just my preference. I think you need to say, right, let's just transfer, you know, 10 million a year and start from there. 30, 30 million a year sounds like half. Like, why not? Just, well, 30, fine. You know, like it's, <laughs> I, you know I'm, I'm, I don't want to come on as an advocate. Um, I'm just saying that how we could do it. it uh, you know, it's not, it's, it shouldn't be just my preferences, you know, if, it, like, you know, I would allocate maybe things differently to somebody else and other people would do. But I think if we make this decision, I think this is like, it's important to realize that these sports capital grants tend to go to areas where, and sports, that are well organized, that have a social network that can literally fill out the form. Because they're, in lots of ways, they're a, they're a, a superb uh, system um, for doing it. Because effectively what the government gets is they get the locals to 
wish that they actually can do this sort of stuff. So they're, they're good in that sense. But we need a way of, if we want to fund uh, sport in disadvantaged areas, we need ways of actually just doing that in a more efficient way, that not, not making it a competition, etc., making it out in the open and say, look, this is what we want to fund in those areas. Yeah, and I guess this, this whole thing has been sparked because of what you just mentioned there, affluent areas being uh, favoured because they are affluent, because they have the funds to actually put down that payment and actually get the matching payment. And it's easy to use that stick to beat Shane Ross with, but I guess when you go back to the other previous sports ministers that have come in since 97, MacDade, O'Donoghue, uh, and, and even when you look at uh, finance ministers like McCreevy, who would have had a huge part in all of this as well, you, you don't exactly think of an area like Wesley, you don't exactly think affluent areas either, and you would wonder why a previous sports minister hasn't looked at this, the, the idea of matching funds. Well, um, it's, I'll put it this way, uh, it, it's probably closely aligned with, with maybe voter turnout and so forth, I have no evidence on this, but if you think about it, you're... You're, you're making the people do a bit of work themselves, fill out the forms, etc. You're in the background, and now you can identify with this. Now you can say, look, I helped you get money for this. If, if, if it's a, a group with, you know, if it's a large group, let's put it this way, if it's a club with a large number of people, not alone do you have a large number of sports-related people, it also means you have a large number of voters. So, you know, I, I, don't, think, I don't think it's in the political interest necessarily of the, the minister to change this, because if you look at this, the, this controversy, the people who are benefiting from the, the money, and the same previously, will probably uh, see any criticism as a criticism of them. Why well, we're entitled to our share, and so I, 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 I just think, you know, if we're looking for political change there, it, it could be slow. And as I say, there are advantages to this scheme. Now, whether you want to reallocate money from this scheme to this sport and disadvantaged areas, and actually just say, look, this is for disadvantaged areas, I think that would be a much more efficient way of doing it and say, look, we're going to spend 10, 30, whatever million per year. We're going to take it from this budget or that budget. Now, imagine if you went and said to Sport Ireland, we're taking it from your budget, they'd be jumping up and down, no, oh, we're doing X, Y, and Z. Um, but, you know, if, we, if, if we're serious, like, you know, what we would call in economics, reveal preference, show us that you're actually serious about this stuff show us where the money is going and don't pay lip service to disadvantaged areas if you want to do this put the money where your mouth is yeah and you could actually let sport ireland spend the money you could allow them to be the ones who ultimately decide how that fund is administered because they would actually through the local sports partnerships have a fair idea where the most disadvantaged areas of need were and what projects might actually work so like i was just going to say that you, ha you have local sports partnerships already there now again you know, I think we should be careful, and this is, where, this is why I got into the research in the, at the very start. My point is that, look, we look at this, let's say, differently uh, in terms of there's less romance involved. That there, this, we wouldn't, I wouldn't presume up front, I would presume that local sports partnerships will, you know, will, will allocate because they're, they're interest groups, etc., in the same manner as a minister will. Okay. Because, but, like, it's not as if the, you know, you can't start from a presumption that the people in local sports partnerships are you know, wonderful and do everything in the public interest, whereas the, those f people who get into the m uh, ministries are, are not. You, so you want to be very careful about presuming that everything will be whiter than white if it goes to local sports partnerships. I did a blog post a, a while back on, uh, you know, local sports partnerships and which local sports partnerships got money. And, you know, I think over time we'll, we'll see whether that will be subject to the same, uh, let's say, bias. Will it follow people who have power over those things we don't know we'll see it's, it's too early to say but I, I i do think that is an avenue though i do think that's a, a like it, they're they're established now they're they're up and running for a few years and i think virtually all counties at this stage so you now have another way of allocating this people who are maybe closer to the ground as well and i think it would be a very good idea and i think let's put it this way it would be a good start to go through that route and say look this is the way we we, we will allocate that money and just keep a close eye on it over a period of time to see how those biases manifest themselves. Like, you, you bring up those biases, John, and I guess that's kind of been at the centre of all of the research that you've done, is that, like, you, you put it very succinctly, the money follows the minister. Yes. How do we stop that? Well, like, you do it... I would say, look, you, do you want the civil servants doing this? No, I would generally speaking, 
in, they can do a good job. Although I think the biggest issue here is how come, you know, was the amount of appeals excessive or whatever? But I would say, look, you need to give the minister some discretion. You need to give the minister some bit of, uh, you need to give them some bit of stuff to allocate because that's just the way it is. And you've tried to constrain that as best as possible, to try to put some rules in place. But it's almost impossible because people will find a way around it. it you know, I, you had yesterday there was uh, somebody on from Neptune in Cork. Um, but before these grants came out, Bernard Allen, I would bet if you can, like Bernard, when I talked to him a number of years ago, um, he said like he did, you know, he looked after the north inner city, city area when he was junior minister in education with responsibility for sport. So it happens. Um, I think you, at best, you can do is probably put in place some rules. But the, the biggest constraint is, you know, programs like yourself um, and so forth that actually highlight this for people. But I don't know if you can do much about it because, as the game was pointed out last night, was um, Shane Ross might be delighted. This is publicity. It's saying he looked after his area. Um, I was on a program with Jim McDade where he said exactly the same. He actually cited my research. He said, uh, 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 John Constantine's research shows that I represented the people of uh, Donegal quite well. So it's, it's a difficult one. But, you know, and again, you know, we all know, as Paul Rose said last night, people, um, we buy into this because when we find we have a, our local TD has become Minister for Sport, we pile in going, can we get a sports grant from you? Uh, Sean O'Connor on the Economics of Sport blog makes the point that potentially when a minister is in this role, the more they get into their reign, the more equal their spend will be around their own county. He doesn't break it down by constituency, but by their own county. Uh, granted, it's a fairly small sample size because what well, John O'Donoghue is in the role for four years, and that's probably the biggest sample size we have. Do you think there's anything in that, that the longer a minister is in this role, that the more they start to wake up and start to realise that if they continue to do this, it's just a complete PR disaster for them? Well, I think uh, it's more to do with the fact that you know, you get in, you don't know how long you're going to be in there, so you look after your own immediate ones first. And if you remember, like, if, if I'm going to allocate, let's say, 100,000 or, or there's a grant or there's sports facilities that needs 100,000 in my area, that means the locals have to come up with some money. So it exhausts, like, the fundraising is not easy. So let's say it takes them a while to get 20, 30,000, whatever the case may be. Um, they're hardly going to come back in very quickly looking for more money because it means they have to raise more money. Um, so I think what happens after a while is as they, they, they start spreading it out because they realize that, look, I've, I've looked after the, the locals, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and uh, now, the other, the, like, as I say, the, the, there is a rigorous system of assessment there. Um, in fact, some people would argue it's too rigorous because it means that, you know, you fill out stuff incorrectly and you might lose out on the grant. So there is that there. So we have we have that system. I just limit the discretion of the minister then to make changes. Okay, so that's the key, really, um, in terms of the influence that the minister can have. If if that can be limited, um, I mean, it's it's hard to understand where that is because we all know that most power in these instances is soft power, that there won't be an email written, there won't be anything <laughs> committed to print. It'll be yeah. a, a cup of coffee saying, that's cool there, they're looking for 150 grand, make sure they get a minimum of 100, and we never had this conversation. Yes, and that's where, and I, I, you know, I presume this will come out in time as organizations, organizations like yourself and newspapers and whatever will probably do FOIs and so forth. It, it would be interesting to see through the appeals process this time, because it, 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 it seems to be hinted at that somehow it was through the appeals process something happened. I, I, I find it difficult to get a, a grip on what the exact suggestion is, um, whether it was, you know, it was through the appeals process that was biased as distinct from the original allocations. Um, but, yeah, as you say, it's, you know, is it not in a wink? And this is the point about, like, believing that we can ever uh, truly fix it up. We're, we're dealing with human nature, be it on side of the voters who want to go to the minister and, and say, look, you know, Mac Dade or Donoghue, Ring, whoever looked after their people, um, you're not now going to look after us, you're not getting voted back in, and does that element from our side, and equally, there's, this, you know, I mean, would any of this have ignited if Shane Ross hadn't sent out a tweet? Um, so he, on the other side, 
they're looking to take credit for it. I mean, sometimes we get uh, politicians who try to take credit for things they didn't even do in representing large business people or other politicians. So it's just human nature, and we, we, we try to constrain it as best we can and, and, and see where we get. But there, there, as I said, there are simpler answers, and maybe there's a bigger debate here. And if, particularly in the area of disadvantage, if we are serious about this, we then allocate a serious amount of money to those areas and say this is specifically for disadvantaged areas. One last question about the, this before. I know Owen has one last one question as well, but should private schools be getting public funding for sports facilities? <laughs> um, like you're now into... Well, you're now into the issue is, are the, you know, to what, they have to be available, let's say, for other uses... Um, the question is why not I mean I, 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 I'll put it this way to you um, the, 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 when we have a, an overlap between public and private services we get a problem it, and it doesn't matter whether it is in sport or not um, you, we see it like in your own area let's say broadcasting you know, a lot of people would argue you know, should RT get the amount of funding they get or should it go to other institutions I, I wouldn't say no, and like the one thing, like Wesley has got a bit of grief over uh, this stuff and, and so forth. Let, let me come in with, let's say, one positive side of things. If we're going to do evidence-based policy, let's say, for example, the SRI did a keeping them in the game uh, study a number of years ago, and when they looked at the leaving search results uh, um, and they looked at the sports that actually generated better leaving search results, the only statistically significant ones or basketball, hockey, and hurling. So maybe the minister could claim he's trying to improve leaving searches. I don't know, but I, that's a bigger, that's a huge issue about this public-private split. Um, like, you know, we have it in hospitals. You know, should, you know, should consultants be allowed to be both public and private? Um, once you get that, um, there's always that danger that people can suggest it's for public interest and it's for private interest. It's a, it is a big area where we need to make a a cleaner divide, but I wouldn't necessarily uh, like stop um, public uh, schools, private schools, I should say, getting uh, public money because if they're delivering what we want, uh, maybe there's an international rugby team or something. Um, you know, why should we, we stop that? I wouldn't necessarily say no, but it is an issue the minute you you, you cross that public-private uh, divide. I was just looking, and this is my final point, uh, at uh, a scholarly article you wrote in 2004 uh, alongside Seamus Coffey and Daniel Kiley. And there was one last point in your conclusions in this article that stuck out to me, and it was that the Prime Minister, the Minister for Finance, and both ministers with responsibility for sports since 1997 are perceived to be sports fans. So obviously you're talking Bertie, you're talking McCreevy, you're talking McDade, you're talking John O'Donoghue. I'm interested to get your take on Shane Ross and his view of sport. Obviously this is the portfolio he's been given. But do you think he's a real sports fan? Do you think he's a, a faux sports fan? What's your take on it? Well, I think, I'll put it this way, um, Let's say he's not the most impressive minister for sport, and I think some of his gas, let's put it this way, or some of the way he carries himself probably contributes to him getting a bit more grief than he should. So whether it is telling people he's going to go over and sort out Pat Hickey or getting the wrong names with particular sports people or brothers and so forth, he hasn't come across as a person who is more clearly identified with sport and probably gets... Uh, plenty of criticism for that. Um, other than that, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't go as far as um, uh, some people who uh, have made comments um, about him, but uh, he, let's say he's, he, he wouldn't be the best minister for sport. On that note, John, great stuff. Thanks very much for joining us this morning. All right, thank you. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that latest offering from Off The Ball. If you want to subscribe, and you should, check out just up here, all our latest stuff is just down here. Generally, knock yourself out.